Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to cardiology lectures. I am Dr. Nick Nickham. I have been a cardiologist for more than 30 years at the Texas Medical Center and today we are going to learn something about basic hemodynamics. So let us begin. The main function of the heart is to pump blood to provide oxygen to every organ in the body including itself. The ability of the heart to pump blood is based on three important parameters namely the preload or the amount of venous blood that is returning to the left ventricular chamber. The contractility or the force with which the ventricle contracts and afterload that is the resistance against which the ventricle has to squeeze. So these three parameters determine the ability of the heart to pump adequate blood into the circulation beat after beat. So let us look at some basic numbers and see how well we can determine how much blood is being pumped into the circulation each minute and what is the efficiency of this heart as a pump. Let us start off with the heart rate which is the easiest one which everyone knows. Heart rate is the number of beats per minute that is number of times the heart is squeezing per minute. Now we have the end diastolic volume. When we talk about end diastolic volume we are primarily referring to the end diastolic volume of the left ventricle that is the amount of blood which fills the ventricle just before the ventricle begins to contract. End systolic volume that is the amount of blood that is left in the ventricle after it has completely squeezed. That means uh, the ventricle does not squeeze every drop of blood it receives it only pumps a certain percentage of the blood that is at the end diastolic phase. So by these two numbers we can deduct the stroke volume that is the amount of blood that is pumped into the aorta with each heart beat. So the stroke volume is equal to end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. If the end diastolic volume is 120 ml and the remaining blood after the ventricular after the ventricle squeezes is 48 ml we have a stroke volume of 72 ml that is with each heart beat the ventricle is squeezing 72 ml of blood into the aorta for distribution to the rest of the body. From these numbers we can calculate another important number known as the ejection fraction which is one of the most important parameters of how well the heart is functioning. It is based on this ejection fraction we say the heart function is normal, the heart function is hyperdynamic or the heart function is low or the patient has congestive heart failure. So let us look at here. The ejection fraction in our example is uh, stroke volume divided by the end diastolic volume which is 76 divided by 120 that is 60 percent of the blood. In other words the ventricle is pumping 60 percent of the blood it has at the beginning of the contraction. This is one of the most in important indicators of the cardiac function as I already told you. The normal ejection fraction is between 55 to 70 percent in patients with hypertension who have hyperdynamic heart or some young people who have hyperdynamic heart their ejection fractions can be close to 80 percent. But in patients with congestive heart failure with history of myocardial infarction and who have dilated heart they can have ejection fractions below 40. We consider that as uh, low ejection fraction or patients with congestive heart failure. Okay. Now let us look at another parameter. We talked about the heart rate. We talked about the amount of blood each time the heart is pumping. 
If we take these two parameters, then we can calculate the cardiac output, which is basically stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate. That is simply the amount of blood that is being pumped into the aorta each beat multiplied by the number of beats per minute gives us the cardiac output per minute which is expressed as liters per minute. Confusing? Rewind the tape and listen. It is very simple. Cardiac output is equal to stroke volume multiplied by heart rate expressed as liters per minute. It is very important to understand the terminology that we use in expressing various parameters when we are talking about cardiac hemodynamics. Right at the beginning, I talked about the three factors that determine the cardiac function, namely the preload, afterload and contractility. Now, let us talk about preload. What is preload? Preload is the amount of blood that is returning to the left ventricle before the ventricle begins to contract. It is a venous return coming from the upper part of the body through the superior vena cava and the venous return coming from the lower part of the body through the inferior vena cava which is eventually pumped through the right heart into the pulmonary artery uh, into the left atrium and eventually it reaches the left ventricle. The larger the preload, the greater is the cardiac output. If we decrease the preload, we decrease the cardiac output. Let us look at some of the things that can increase the preload. Elevation of the legs will return more venous blood to the heart, thus increasing the preload. Squatting also increases the venous return, thus increasing the preload. Patients with heart failure and kidney failure due to volume retention have increased preload. Polycythemia and anemia with hemodilution because of increased intravascular volume, they have increased preload. Let us look at some of the things that decrease the preload, namely standing decreases the preload because of the venous pooling of the blood. Similarly, dehydration which decreases the intravascular volume can decrease the preload. Diuretics do the same thing and the nitrates dilate the venous system and thus cause venous pooling and thus decrease the preload. Now, let us talk about the afterload. Afterload is a very complex term, but uh, it simply means the systemic vascular resistance. As you know, the main aorta divides into smaller branches like the main arteries, then into arterioles and, and the capillaries. As the vessels become smaller and smaller and smaller, there is increased resistance to the flow of blood. The total resistance between aorta and the left atrium is considered the systemic vascular res resistance. Similarly, we also have a pulmonary vascular resistance, which is the difference between the mean pulmonary artery pressure and the mean left atrial pressure. When we have a vascular resistance, the ventricle has to pump against that vascular resistance to get the blood to the main circulation to supply the oxygen and nutrients to every organ in the body. As we increase the systemic vascular resistance, we are increasing the resistance across which the blood has to pump. As a result, uh, the cardiac output goes down. Some of the conditions where we see increased peripheral resistance include elevated blood pressure, heart failure or certain drugs which cause vasoconstriction like norepinephrine. The conditions that decrease the afterload or the systemic vascular resistance improve the forward output of the left ventricle because there is less resistance to the flow of blood. This is one of the principles we use in treating patients with congestive heart failure who have high systemic vascular resistance by giving them vasodilators and ACE inhibitors which decrease the systemic vascular resistance.
Similarly, patients with uh, high cardiac output such as anemia, hyperthyroidism or pregnancy also have dilatation of the blood vessels which decrease the systemic vascular resistance. Now, we talked about the preload, we talked about the afterload of the systemic vascular resistance. Now, let us talk about the contractility of the ventricle which is the main pumping function of the cardiac chambers especially the right and the left ventricles. Uh, predominantly when we are talking about contractility, we are more focused on the left ventricular contractility. The force with which the ventricle pumps the blood is known as the contractility. The contractility is based on the preload, the amount of blood that is coming into the heart before it begins to contract. It is also dependent on the resistance against which it has to pump. But there is a third parameter and that is the pumping efficiency of the heart muscle or the chamber itself. If there is damage to the myocardium as we see in patients with myocardial infarction, then there is reduced efficiency of the pump because of the pump failure. We can also see similar conditions in patients with uh, myocarditis or patients who have significant valvular problems like mitral regurgitation, aortic regurgitation. In these conditions, the heart dilates it and it loses its pumping efficiency. And when there is decreased pumping efficiency, there is decrease in cardiac output. As I told you at the beginning, the pumping efficiency of the heart is one of the most significant factors that reflect how well the heart is functioning in maintaining the cardiac output to supply the oxygen to every organ in the body and that is expressed as ejection fraction. The normal ejection fraction again is 50 to 70 percent. Now let us look at some other hemodynamic parameters that we use in assessing cardiovascular function. One such parameter is the cardiac output or simply Q which is the flow. How much blood is flowing through the heart in one minute which is expressed as cardiac output as liters per minute. The cardiac output is determined by as I told you already the pressure which is the systemic vascular resistance which is the pressure change between the aorta and the right atrium divided by the systemic vascular resistance. In other words, if we know two of the three parameters, we can calculate the third one. For example, if we know the pressure that is the delta pressure which is the mean arterial pressure minus the mean right atrial pressure that is the pressure difference between the aorta and the right atrium which forms the beginning and the end of the systemic circulation. This pressure difference divided by the resistance offered by these blood vessels helps us to determine the cardiac output and we can use this same formula and we can calculate the systemic vascular resistance if we know the cardiac output and pressure and if we know the pressure and systemic vascular resistance we can calculate the cardiac output. So, here is the formula for systemic vascular resistance which is the pressure or the delta pressure delta P which is the difference between the mean aortic pressure and the mean right atrial pressure divided by the cardiac output. Now, let us use a simple example to see how we can apply this to find out what is the systemic vascular resistance. That is, what is the total resistance against which the left ventricle has to pump blood with each heartbeat. From the previous slide, we came to the conclusion that the systemic vascular resistance is equal to the delta P which is the pressure difference between the mean arterial pressure and the right atrial pressure divided by the cardiac output along with a conversion factor which will, which I will talk about in a minute. Let us assume for a minute we have a cardiac output of say 5 liters per minute. Let us assume the mean arterial pressure is uh, 
we are talking mean blood pressure. We are not talking about systolic or diastolic pressure. This is the mean arterial pressure, mean arterial pressure of 100 and a mean right atrial pressure of uh, 5 millimeters of mercury which gives us a mean delta P of 95 millimeters of mercury. Now, we can calculate the systemic vascular resistance by this uh, formula that is 95 millimeters of mercury which represents the delta P multiplied by 79.92 which is a constant which is used to equalize the measurements because we are dealing with different parameters here. The pressure is expressed as millimeters of mercury, cardiac output is expressed as liters per minute. In order to normalize these numbers to give us a meaningful result, we use a conversion factor which is 79.92 in calculating the systemic vascular resistance. By plugging in these numbers, we come up with a systemic vascular resistance which is equal to 1518. The systemic vascular resistance is uh, expressed in dynes times uh, second divided by centimeter to the minus fifth power. But in simple terms, it is simply expressed as 1518 dynes D Y N E S. The normal systemic vascular resistance is between 900 to 1200 dynes, whereas the pulmonic vascular resistance is between 50 and 140 dynes. We can calculate the pulmonic vascular resistance by simply substituting the aortic pressure with the pulmonary mean pulmonary artery pressure and substituting the right atrial pressure with the mean left atrial pressure because the cardiac output remains the same on both right and left sides of the heart. Let us look at some of the normal hemodynamic values which we must be familiar with. The mean right atrial pressure can right atrial pressure can vary between 2 and 5 millimeters of mercury. The right ventricular pressure is 25 over 5 millimeters of mercury which is systolic over diastolic. Similarly, we have a pulmonary artery pressure. Pulmonary artery pressure is 25 over 10 millimeters of mercury. The mean arterial pressure could be anywhere from 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury. The mean left atrial pressure is approximately 8 to 10 millimeters of mercury. In addition to cardiac output, we express the cardiac index which is a better indicator of how the heart is functioning based on the body surface area of a given individual. If you take a real thin person who weighs 100 pounds and compare that to a person who weighs 300 or 400 pounds, we need a number that is reflective of uh, the patient's overall physique. So, we use cardiac index which is basically cardiac output divided by body surface area expressed in meter square. Please note that meter is expressed as capital M that is the abbreviation for meter. So, the cardiac index is expressed as liters per minute per meter square. That is a more practical way of expressing the cardiac output based on the body requirements which is related to the body size and habitus. So, ladies and gentlemen, this, over, this is a brief overview of basic hemodynamics. I hope uh, this has been useful to you. I am Dr. Nick Nickham and if you would like to learn more about any other topics in cardiology, please drop a comment in the section below and we will be happy to create a video presentation for your learning. Again, I am Dr. Nick Nickham and thank you so much for your attention.